Thank you. So yeah, uh, been uh, that was a great previous couple presentations to get us going. Uh, the the bid on the OGC. Another role I play is uh, I have a badge here somewhere. There it is. OGC. I'm a regional chair for the Australia OGC. Australia New Zealand OGC forum, which hasn't been very active, but it still is there and I'm actually there and hopefully at some time we'll get a, going a little bit more. But this talk in particular is about standards and, ha and the history of standards and the future of standards within, the o within the, both communities, open source and open uh, standards communities. So find my, how come that's not going ahead? My clicker's not working. There it goes. So yeah, the obligatory uh, XK, XKCD cartoon. And uh, very much about standards. So standards, yes, yeah, standards. Why are they important? They keep us sane, yes, but they are very important. But most of the time, we don't even think about standards. Standards regulate everything we do in our lives, pretty much. Standards about how we drive on the road, which side, uh, the standards about shipping containers, standards about how the internet works. None of that would really function well without the standards. And most of the time we don't think about them, they're just background to us and we, and we ignore them, but we, but we abide by them and they make our lives a lot easier. Talking about standards in general, I wanted to start with this because I think there's some very good analogies that uh, apply to our domain. So battery standards. The batteries all come in a standard size, right? You know, a standard size and voltage. Products are designed around those standard sizes and voltages, and uh, and we, we get used to them. It's just something that we know how to do. But things are changing. Now we have rechargeable devices that, um, come on, there it goes. Like this vacuum, which we have the exact model in our office, and it's a four years old, a hand-me-down. It lasts about 90 seconds. And I would love to replace the batteries, but it's designed not to be able to. It's a form-fitting thing that if you got into it to replace the batteries, even if you could, uh, you'd break the thing and be no good anymore. There's other uh, approaches that uh, companies take, like this, these devices here. The, they have a separate battery pack that you can buy more of so you can keep all your devices running. They're even interoperable with all the devices with their own range. And likewise for the um, other companies, like Black & Decker has the same thing. But if you want to use them together, forget it. They don't interoperate. These are pri proprietary standards and you cannot play together. They don't play nice together. But what if you open these things up? What do you see? There's standard sized batteries with standard sized voltages. The manufacturers get to take advantage of standardization by purchasing these as a commodity from other manufacturers. And even in that, uh, in that one, uh, that vacuum, if we could open it up and replace them, we could. Had a great introduction to FAIR before, and I'm going to go into this a little more. FAIR being the uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These are principles that we really support in the open communities. In the proprietary world, it's not necessarily in their interest to really make things fully interoperable. So there's a, the, while they may try to be FAIR, there's other pressures within uh, companies that make things not so FAIR. Where do the standards come from? Well, they come from a number of places. At the top here, we have the, the main organizations, ISO and Open Geospatial Consortium. Those are the two organizations that make most of the standards that we're, we use in this uh, community. There's others, W3C, IETF, FGDC, and, and then at the regional level, well, FGDC is one of the regional ones. Uh, I, ICSM and ANZIC for this part of the world, very important, INSPIRE for Europe. These guys kind of make more uh, guidance about how to implement the standards up there. They may have some of their own. And at the bottom, these are the, the domain areas. And this is where really most of the products that we make get implemented, is within communities. And these, these uh, groups oversee how those things actually work. They're more at the, the bleeding edge there. So within the OSGEO, there's a number of standards out there that, or products out there that have been built specifically for open standards. Uh, and there's pages and pages of them. It'll start going, there it goes. And uh, 
a couple of these are, are really notable. GeoNetwork, obviously, for the CSW and the ISO 19115, it's built around that, and it very purposely supports that. There's a, a GeoServer, that's a reference implementation for WFS, WMS, those style layer descriptors, uh, 52 degrees north with sensor observation services, and a Zoo Project, uh, WPS. So m many of these were designed specifically to implement these standards. That's why they that's why they were created. And so what standards are we talking about? Well, focusing on the on the catalog standards because that's where both of us are, are the metadata and catalog standards. That's where mo both of us are most familiar. There's ISO family, and it should be noted that the ones that most people use are now deprecated and uh, people haven't really moved to the new ones. The 115 1 and 3 are the most common. There's a JSON encoding that I'm working on. Uh, with others in, in ISO. Uh, and then there's things like schema.org, which is you know, a well-known standard out there for web pages and has some geo aspects to it. But if you really start using the geo parts, they aren't really friendly to geographers. They think some, a different way. Dublin Core, that's uh, great for discovery level metadata, but often you need more than that. So if you use Dublin Core, make sure it points back to a more complete metadata record if you can. GeoDCAD is kind of a new standard that uh, um, is going to become more and more important, I think. Uh, it was developed a few years ago. The OGC is taking it over to make sure it, uh, it's sustainable and well-maintained into the future. And, of course, there's any number of domain-specific standards, uh, maybe by region, like the ANSLIC, Old ANSLIC or MCP for the Marine, that are all on that 115 base, but many others. Catalog standards. This is a different category. These are a little bit different than the, than the metadata standards. They're about how do you search and share the metadata over the web. And uh, many, some have been around for a while, the CSW from OGC, OAI PMH, and these are things that all that uh, Geo Network does support or are looking to support in the future. The new ones at the bottom uh, have some uh, support in Geo Network, but as they're not entirely uh, finished, it's kind of hard to do them entirely. Stack, and uh, I was really happy to see at the last OGC meeting because there's been confusion of this catalog standards versus uh, metadata standards, and they specifically said it's not a, it's not a uh, metadata standard. So that was really nice. So open source metadata tools, really nice to hear of this uh, new one that uh, Greg talked about. I hadn't come across that because a recent project I did uh, and, and uh, survey to see what's out there, they're decreasing in number and not increasing. And we'll be talking about GeoNetwork. Esri has one that's open source as well. The rest of those, really for the geospatial, rely on PyCSW and PyGeo, that whole stack of things to, get, to work. And uh, there's some updating that we hope to uh, get involved in here very soon, kicking off some work on that to do that. But, for a use case, I'd really like to focus on GeoNetwork. And Karun will come up and uh, talk about how it implements standards and its future that way. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'll start a bit with introducing myself once the monitor switches, I guess. <laughs> um, but I, I've been in uh, open source development since uh, 2000 for about 20 something years now, 23, 24. Uh, started GeoNetwork open source uh, while working at the United Nations and, uh, and I've always been quite a fanatic on <laughs> making everything free and open source software, uh, because I think it's the way to share uh, knowledge. And, uh, and for me, FOSS stands for freedom, uh, and not per se free in, in, in the commercial way. <laughs> I think it should be free in the commercial, or in the, in the, let's say, to distribute it, but it should definitely be free in spirit. Uh, so you have, they, uh, you can access source code, others can benefit of, of the developments you do. Uh, and that to me is really uh, essential. Um, 
I left the United Nations after close to 10 years to start my own company, GeoCAP. It's all about spatial data publication and discovery, uh, building software and products, services, uh, and always this free and open source software philosophy is core of our DNA. So we, we do have products and we sell those products commercially. And so I think commercial software is perfectly fine and it can also be free and open source. Uh, it doesn't have to be proprietary, which is the essential difference. Uh, our products are free and open source. We have enterprise products, uh, but you still get the source code there. And our community proje projects always follow what we develop for enterprise products. We have an office in uh, the Netherlands, in Binnacom, which is where I'm located. We have a Canadian entity, and we have a partnership now with uh, OpenWork in uh, New Zealand to also have uh, access to the New Zealand Australia market. We do a lot of, uh, of sponsoring on uh, open source uh, at the OSGO, the Phosphor G. International Conference is also in this conference, uh, even though we're a very small team. But I think it proves that even if you do free and open source software as a small company, you can still make money and still sponsor and do, <laughs> do good in that sense. So GeoNetwork, uh, what is it for people that don't know? It's a very comprehensive metadata editing and management tool, and it's glue in spatial data infrastructure. Uh, and the basic building blocks of it are ISO TC211 standards, OGC standards, uh, W3C standards. They are key. What is nice about open source software is that everybody can actually look at how those standards have been implemented. So if there's something happening in a black box, who knows, you can start decompiling, you can't, you can't really see what happened. Uh, in an open source software you can, and as any individual here in the room or, or anywhere around the world, you can actually inform people, of the developers, that there's an error somewhere. So it started back in 2000 when I was working at the United Nations. It got spread among the UN system to, to actually share uh, geospatial information within the UN system. Uh, and we've continued developing it. And currently we have uh, around over 50, sorry, over 85% of the national endpoints of the European Union uh, that serve data for the Inspire uh, spatial data infrastructure running on GeoNetwork. It's been an OSGEO project since 2007. That's two years after the inception of OSGEO. And uh, this is an old article from 2003, I think, talking about the, the application in its first instance. We have current releases, uh, two of those, won't go into detail. Uh, but this is a sample of uh, the national, Dutch National Geo Registry, uh, where all geospatial data from the Netherlands is coming together. So powerful metadata editor. And here's where you see that there is a validation at the top right, uh, which actually allows you to then validate according to those standards. If that is country specific, domain specific, it doesn't really matter, the whole system is agnostic to it. Uh, so it's always, when we build things, they have to comply to standards so you can actually do validation. Big interface where you can actually configure what standards you want to support and how you want to make things available. <laughs> and currently we are using, working a lot on, on new iterations of the user interface, which is basically the front end, not so much related to the standards here. Uh, but we're getting towards things like kind of Netflix interfaces on top of geospatial and other type of data open data. So as Byron mentioned, uh, OGC standards, ISO standards are key. And if you look at the application itself, uh, 
to connect different catalogs together uh, in, in a kind of confederation. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of accessing other catalogs. And uh, this is just a list of different versions and standards supported to connect different type of catalogs together. Or you see, sometimes they are proprietary, or at least they are just uh, defined by by uh, software itself or other type of international standards. Metadata, the same thing. So as I said, the system is agnostic towards the standards. Um, and it means that we can actually start adding new type of metadata uh, standards that are coming along, like the DCAT uh, and the GeoDCAT. And that's something where we're currently working on. One is the OGC API records, a uh, new set of standards, the OGC API standards. The records is focusing on discoverability, so it's related to what, uh, what is currently used as the catalog service for the web, the CSW standard. Uh, a new iteration there is, is OGC API records, um, which will make a lot of the data and metadata findable in a much better way through things like Google or Bing or other search engines. So we work on, on implementing what is currently in draft still. And the way we do that is, is so one other thing. Uh, if you implement such a thing, <laughs> you still have many, many different options in the way you create your output. So in order to make sure that you really have a system that can connect to many other systems or other systems can connect to your system, you have to really think of what kind of output formats do I support within that one specification? Uh, so within OGC API records, we have to support HTML, we have to support XML output formats, uh, JSON, RSS, DCAT, GeoDCAT, Turtle, schema.org, and so on. Uh, so it is actually quite big in terms of what, what needs to be supported. We do them usually one by one or a couple of them at a time. Uh, but we also always welcome others to start contributing uh, other type of output formats or catalog formats. Uh, then what we do is we run through the OGC validator <laughs> um, and, uh, and we try to get as many of the standards that we implement. Uh, in this case, this is more about uh, GeoServer, but uh, to get as much of the standards that we can validate at OGC uh, validated so people know that the product is actually compliant. Yeah, I put this in because I think this is <laughs> probably the most critical thing about uh, implementing standards is that you do this with other people that are involved in uh, in working or developing the standards and, and coding in different applications. Uh, one thing I've been organizing since uh, 2007 is an annual code sprint in, uh, in Italy. At the, uh, it's at an old convent, uh, an old monastery. And we basically come together with 20, 25 people. And the only thing we do during that uh, week and, and the last two years, even two weeks, is just work together on improving the implementations of the standards uh, between different applications, between in our own applications, uh, prototyping, and really work together to, uh, yeah, to have better output in uh, open source products. Uh, the nice thing is that we always go there with my company, <laughs> but we're about half of the people. And the other half is other people coming and, uh, and working with us. It's kind of a holiday. At the same time, it's really, really cool to work together uh, in such an environment. And we try to do this once a year at the convent. We have two, usually about two other uh, times a year where we try to come together with several people to work on those. Um, and that's, I think, what is key. And uh, 
probably other me also the message here. If you want to really have good implementations, come together with different people from different uh, companies and, uh, and make it happen. So, as I said, we also had some other meetings. We joined OGC. <laughs> we joined the OGC sprints that were organized in London, uh, also others. Um, so to work with OGC uh, on, on actually uh, defining the standards. We also met last year at, uh, at Camp to Camp, a company in Switzerland with people from PyCSW, with people from GeoNetwork, and just trying to see how we can make those things work well. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Euron. Uh, any questions from the floor? All right, well, I have a few more. <laughs> Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, Geo uh, DCAT, if, if any of you can speak to that. I've just n not ever heard of it, but it sounded very interesting. Oh, well, I guess I my role. Currently, I'm chairing an OGC uh, standards working group that's for uh, Geo DCAT development. Uh, if you're familiar with the W3C standard of DCAT, it's a cataloging standard that's uh, based on RDS, a uh, triple store type thing that makes it much easier to track uh, the relationships between the value. You know, what if you have a field and a value, what's that relationship about and how does it link? It's, it's much easier to link everything together with meaning rather than just foreign key type, primary key type things that we're mostly used to. So that's kind of the basis for DCAT. GeoDCAT, and so this is a W3 standard for how you do that, DCAT is, and it's gone through a few iterations. Uh, I think they're at working on, still working on version three right now. Uh, back in 2015, 16, I can't remember exactly now. Um, they, it, with, through Semic and Inspire, an organization aligned with Inspire in Europe, they developed a, a a geo profile of that. It wasn't fully compliant with ISO 1105 standard, but it was, did most of it. So you could put the data into this linked data format and take all the advantage of that. What's happened now is that that was set up as a project, not a program, which means that it was a one-off. And as things changed in other standards and people wanted to have other stuff in there, it didn't keep up with the times. So what the OGC is doing now is setting up this standards working group as an ongoing standards working group to make sure that we have modern support for the bringing in the latest changes in DCAT and all the needed geospatial extensions and, uh, and growing from there. It's in its early stages. We've just barely started on it. So uh, got a lot of input from others would be welcome. And yeah, hey, if anyone wants to become a member of OGC, just talk to me. Absolutely. All right. Oh. Question? Go on. So you guys would know a lot about how what's important in our community. And for those people who are new to the community, what do you think um, is the most sort of like resilient and sustaining elements that we should really focus on? That's a good one for you. <laughs> uh, so I have to process a bit of the English. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, what, what's, what, what makes us strong and what should we focus on um, as we go in the future for our community? Yeah. Um, there's a, yeah, it's, there's, there's uh, I think, two important. No. Mm. One, one is coming together virtually or, or in, in person to just uh, help understand what what software does, how, how can you work with it. Um, so that in that sense, this kind of events is really, really important. And I think uh, workshops would even be nicer if there's more hands-on workshops uh, in that sense. Um, and, and 
The other one is make sure that you're not afraid to actually start asking questions or start contributing. Uh, what I see a lot is that people take the software as is, uh, don't think, you know, start evaluating it, see complications. We just had it yesterday at, actually in the workshop, which was a nice example. If you start your network as it is, you're just overwhelmed with 500,000 possibilities. And you probably evaluate and say, oh, well, this is too much for us. If you're not involving with the people that know the software and that can help you uh, understand what you can actually do and how you can use it in your case, uh, you'll stay away from it and maybe buy something that is just easy but not free and open source or has other <laughs> issues, is maybe not a standard compliant. Uh, so that, that interaction as being new into a community and, and start asking questions is really something that uh, the people need to feel comfortable about, but also need to just do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, any last questions before we break for lunch? One down the back. Keep this quick, just I was so just we wondering don't. about the community project you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation, that you had uh, uh, provided the software as part of the um, uh, uh, within New Zealand. Yes, uh, some of the uh, communities were using it. C could you please explain how they are using the software? Uh, within New Zealand, some of some of the people I've helped with Geo Network. Ah, it's a broad range. Uh, it's been across Australia and New Zealand, from big organizations like Geoscience Australia, that's about as big as you get in this part of the world, down to a local iwi of a couple thousand members that use it to manage our data resources to, uh, to just, yeah, you get a bunch of data and it lands in a box, how do you know what you got, how do you use it, how do you bring it together? And so just that sort of management purpose. So it, it goes kind of the whole gamut and a lot of people in between. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case thing, but it all uses the same standards and the same software under the hood, so they can share up and down. <laughs>